giver of peace in the storm and out. Oh God, the lifter of our head, the restorer of our soul. Thank you, Lord, for being a present, present, present help in the time of trouble. Amen. Let's thank Him together again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He doesn't just bring us through it. He walks through it with us. The woman at the well met Jesus. She had no idea who he was. A lot of people encounter him and and are clueless. And that's okay. It's those who are clueless after they encounter him that we have to worry about. And she wanted to talk about where the worship service should take place. She wanted to talk about which old time doctrine was correct. And he took her three steps past that. He said, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But the water that I give you will be in you a well, springing up into everlasting life. He didn't say that we wouldn't go through valleys and hardship and loneliness and loss and frustration and separation. But he said, I never had to go through that thirsty. Wherever you are today, it is the will of God for His presence, His Spirit to be in you so that no matter what's happening with the job or the marriage or the house or your health, those external forces are one thing, but what He wants to do, He wants to do down in the core of the essence of who you are. And He'll be with you right there. And I thank God for that. Amen. Amen, amen. I'm glad to see you today. Uh, can I be honest? We didn't get any real weather at my house. My phone rang and uh, early this morning and one beep after another and it was pretty obvious that some of you uh, were experiencing different things than I and the pictures and videos are just incredible. Uh, uh, the Bensons aren't here today but uh, Brother Matt Benson called to ask if we were having service and then in the midst of the call as the water began to rise he said well I'm not sure we can get out of our driveway anyway and by the time we hung up they had water coming into the house so I know some of you uh, uh, went through a lot to get here. I thought there'd be about 10 of us. I had a, a, a word just to preach to my wife but I'm glad you're here today and and uh, we're certainly praying uh, uh, for everyone who's affected by hell damage and, and all of that kind of stuff. Gentlemen, fellas, public announcement, two quick things. Number one, Wednesday is Valentine's Day. You have been warned. Also, piggybacking with that, service Wednesday night. There's two great things happening. One, uh, uh, church may not last but 15 minutes because my pastor, W.W. W. Smith, will be here preaching. And I'm looking forward to that. And he's uh, um, a little shorter winded than some of us are. And so uh, if, you're, if you're planning on a late dinner, you can still squeeze that in after church. Or what I suggest you do is if you happen to forget about the holiday, use service as an excuse and tell your spouse you just intended to assume you guys would be celebrating Thursday. And, and so all will be where. We're looking, we're looking forward to that. It is going to be tremendous. And I apologize. This wasn't the youth's fault. It's mine. But as the calls begin to come from Sunday school teachers that couldn't physically get out of their neighborhood and, and all that kind of stuff, and we delayed Sunday school, uh, I really expected even a slimmer crowd than we had today. And so we delayed that youth fundraising dinner for one week. And if you've already paid and can't make that work next Sunday, catch me and we'll, we'll, we'll make that right with you. But Matthew chapter 14, as we go to the word of the Lord, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to begin at verse number 22. Matthew 14, 22. I saw on social media, I was tagged in a prayer request group of well-meaning believers who gathered together praying out of concern that Taylor Swift's concert in Japan would finish in time for her plane to get her to the Super Bowl today. 
I've been tagged in prayer groups about particular whales that were slow and tagged and slow in making the journey from Alaska to Hawaii or, or vice versa. I've had some of my favorite prayer requests from children. Amazing things. The faith of a child. And I guess it's true, if nothing's a big deal to the Lord, then, then nothing is, is small either. And I've often chuckled at some of the prayer requests that uh, I, I see floating around social media. And then I try to take that next step and say, God, I want to think about you just like that. I want to bring every care and concern. Every care. I'm not that worried about Sister Taylor's flight pattern, but you know, every care and concern. Life can put you in such a whirlwind that some things seem so large and some so small. So with that in mind, Matthew 14, 22, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. I want to point out the ship is God's plan. And to go before him unto the other side. The trip is God's plan. While he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea in the will of God, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. I'm afraid because now there's a ghost outside. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him, and said, Lord, if it be thou, if you're really doing this, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship, then they that were in the ship, came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, thou art the Son of God. There's a lot to unpack there, and we're not going to even try to get to it all. But just for a moment, I want to talk to us about the wind, the water, and the weatherman. The wind, the water, and the weatherman. Let's ask him to help us. God, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your blessings. We ask right now that you just be with us in this service one more time, that we could take a step toward you, and God, leave here more like you than we are right now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. We'll just clap our hands to him one more time. Hallelujah. And you may be seated. I want to dive right in to a concept. Our job here, of course, is to teach and preach the Word of God. It's to worship the Lord. It's to fellowship one with another. It's to spread the gospel. There are multiple purposes spare, uh, sp uh, you know, uh, stated in the New Testament for the New Testament church. And we really do individually and collectively have to try to live up to all of them. And it can be a frustrating thing when the Word of God calls us to do something individually and we're waiting on the collective to do it. And 
And it can be equally frustrating when we ignore the collective call and focus only on the individual. If we're going to do it right, we've got to try to obey and live out the entire form and purpose of the Scripture. But in the midst of that, we are creatures of habit. There are things that we're familiar with and things that we're comfortable with. All of us live with our own comfort zones. We all have those uh, mental and emotional safe areas. And when we're moving into new territory, there can be excitement and there can also be concern and, and natural temptation and caution. Now, the real difference in what happens to us as we go through this life and navigate in our walk with God and the kingdom of God, all through the scripture and goodness, I've seen it all through my life and the lives of others. It, it quickly comes to fruition. It really does matter what we do and do not naturally or by choice focus on. Where we are looking really does determine where we are heading. And our failure and success in so much of life, but certainly in our spiritual life, can, can be set almost entirely by what where or who we focus on. And I want to tell you, when we continue in this journey of faith, whether we sink or swim is usually determined almost entirely by what we are watching. Now, there's so much in this story. We're not going to try to, uh, to, to move it all. And I've heard layers of teaching and preaching on it that, that I believe and, and that is accurate. But I want to focus on one tiny concept today. There's a few things there that, 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 that when I read it in the past, I've seen myself. And there are things there that, that when I've read, I've seen all of us. You know, the, the, the disciples were settled. Most of them were professional fishermen. It was their comfort zone. Jesus called some of these men out of boats quite literally the first time he encounters Peter he, he says I'm going to use your vessel launch out a little bit the people have pressed on me I'm going to use your vessel for a floating platform and I'm going to teach the masses and then and then he pays him back he gives him a great multitude of fish so that the net breaks and the ship begins to sink and he calls Peter and Peter goes with him so Peter and James and John they were comfortable in the boat it was a vessel they were familiar with and now in our text he orders them to climb into this vessel and to go to the other side of the sea last year we preached about this from the book of John an entirely different message about storms but in this case he commands them to get into the ship and to go to the other side of the sea and they're comfortable in the ship because they're professional fishermen these men grew up in a ship like that it's not a structure that they're unfamiliar with they have the skill set they feel that they need to navigate treacherous waters. After all, this is what they've done all of their lives. And they're not concerned about the, the, that I can see uh, about the ship in this storm because they know that it was built to ride through storms. It was designed for waves. It was designed for heavy winds. They had confidence in the vessel. Now here's where some people really do trip up. So listen to me closely. The vessel was God's idea. Idea. Jesus Christ looked at them and said, I want you to get into the vessel and I want you to go to the other side of the sea. The will of God was not up for negotiation. Get in the vessel, get in the boat and go to the other side of the sea. Cross this 7.2 miles. I, I wish I had time to dig into this, but that vessel was a lot like the New Testament church. It, 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 it's something that was God's idea. It was something God built it and you you hear me he built it for storms first Peter chapter 3 kind of compares it to Noah's ark it's the same concept he built the ark for the flood he built the church for the storm he really are born and bred for the briar patch we're designed for issues and the church was born in the midst of persecution it was born at a time when it quickly became illegal that first wave of revival
revival broke out when the Jews primarily and the Roman government later secondarily were persecuting the church. They weren't worried about waves. They weren't worried about winds. They believed that God designed it for a purpose. The Bible said that Noah's Ark had one window. It had one door. God built it for a purpose. And when the rain began to fall and the fountains of the deep sprang and that water began to come up, Noah didn't have to be afraid. God gave him the design and he designed the ark for the storm. Now this isn't what we're preaching about today, but you listen to me. We need not. It is not the will of God for us to look fearfully with trembling knees into the coming calendar and into the coming uh, erosion of our world. He told us from the beginning that evil men and seducers would wax worse and worse. He told us there'd be a great falling away. He told us what was going to happen to the world. We're not going to waste our lives trying to stop Bible prophecy from being fulfilled. You hear me? It is going to be fulfilled. But before God built the boat, he knew about the storm. And whatever happens, and whatever we have to go through until the trumpet sounds and he comes for us again, we don't have to live in fear of that. This book is a warning. It's not meant to turn us into petrified preppers who hide in caves and try to miss the outcome of the scripture. Honey, we have a purpose. God designed the church for the storm. And here the disciples are in the midst of the boat. But they're safe. They were rowing against the wind. It must have blown them backwards. Here they are. They've been rowing for hours. They're only halfway across, John tells us. But they don't seem to be panicking. They're not in the boat by themselves. We're not preaching about this today, but I thank God I'm not in the boat by myself. I thank God it's his boat and his idea, but we really do need each other. That word fitly spoken, apples of gold and pictures, I thank God for that. I thank God, not just for the ministries he sent into my life, but the friends and the brethren and even the troubles that are from time to time necessary. They're in the boat. Jesus told them to get in the boat. They're in the boat together and they have a storm, but they're rowing. And now they look out and they see the storm. Perhaps, no doubt, they commented on it. The Bible doesn't really record what they had to say, but we don't see them just panicking or overly concerned, not yet. But while they're in that boat working, laboring, hurting, but safe, imagine their shock when they look up and see Jesus walking outside of the boat. Now this is where you lose some people. The boat was God's idea. Get in the boat and go to the other side. The will of God. But there are some people who cannot bring themselves to believe that Jesus is walking and working outside of their boat. The boat was God's idea. Okay, don't don't misunderstand what I'm fixing to say. The local assembly, the local church is God's idea. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and so much more as you see the day approaching. This movement that says we're in the end time and the church isn't perfect and we should do this at home by ourselves, honey, that is an anti-Christ demonic, anti-scriptural. That, that is not the plan of God. But let me tell you what's dangerous too. Jesus told us to get in the boat. Jesus told us to go to the other side. I don't know what that is walking out there, but it's not inside of these walls, so it can't be Jesus. The boat's God's idea. We're in it. He told me to get in it, and I'm in it, and and I'm not getting out. So whatever that is, that's not the Holy Ghost. Mm. He sent them in the boat, and he's walking right by it. He's preaching. uh, let's, Let's not use real names preaching in a church in, a, let's make up a place, Kansas. And I was very young. How old are you? 16, I was 17. But, you know, you're 18. I was right between you guys. My hair was darker. And, and uh, I, I'm preaching in 
this faraway imaginary place. And um, the, it, was, it was quite a journey. I, I couldn't find the church, and I, I'm, I'm lost in this, this town. And, and we didn't have smartphones. I didn't have a phone phone in my car. And, and you know, we didn't have, like, GPS and, and even MapQuest, which is way back there for you guys. We had these maps like they were paper, and they had lines on them, and you just had to... <laughs> You remember those? My wife had never used one. We were on a car trip. We were newlyweds. We were on our honeymoon. And I'm teaching her to read a map. So she's got the atlas. We're on our way to Gatlinburg. And I said, okay, tell me what to do. And she said, you take the black road out of Knoxville. You go down about an inch and a half. She might pretend like she was joking, but I knew the truth that I heard. It was a different world. And so I learned something that day that was true the entire time I evangelized. You can't ask for directions when you're dealing with a small town local. If they've lived there all their life, they can't help you. Brother Long, I was preaching in Tennessee one time and I stopped at a service station. I was looking for a church. I said, can you tell me where this is? She says, yeah, you go down to where good you used to be. Thank you, thank you. Do you know the McNally Farm? No, I happen to have never met any of them in this town I've never been to. So I need directions. This is a true story. This lady behind the counter, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, it's, it's not Southern hospitality. I hadn't even got to ask her yet, and, she was not the friendliest person in the world, let's just say that. And so I didn't even get to the word church. I found somebody else and asked them, and they got me there, thank the Lord. Revival started that night, and guess who walked in? That gas station tenant, the mean one. And when they introduced her to me, she kind of did a double take. She was so sweet after that. Now, I believe in brotherly love, but I don't understand folks who, who, who treat the people that walk with the Lord with them like gold and, and then represent them like... Mm. And so revival walked on. She said, you grew up in a so-and-so kind of church. I said, I sure did. She said, we got one of those down the road. You know what's happened there? I said, what? She said, they had an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, like a real one. Like a few dozen of them. It's about to split their church. I mean, it's, it sounds like all the real stuff, but we know that that can't be God. Because it's not happening in our boat. You'll never convince me Jesus is doing stuff for other people. It's not in our boat. They're not even in our fellowship. They don't come to our camp meeting. I don't know about... You know what Jesus said? He, the disciples said, we found people casting out devils who were not of this way. So we told them to stop doing that. We forbid them. He said, don't you dare forbid them. He who's not against us is for us. Listen to me. The boat's God's idea. Honey, it's not going to empty out. You need to do what he said. But if he wants to walk out into the storm and do something else somewhere else, we don't need to fight that. We need to do everything we can to pour gasoline on that fire. Now, I wasn't a mature 18-year-old yet. I was still young. She said, what do you think of that? I said, well, from what I see here and what you're telling me there, maybe he's just whipping up your replacement for this city. Because if you think God's going to ride off a town because you don't want to reach it, honey, that's not how this is going to work. They looked out. They saw Jesus Christ walking on the sea. But they couldn't convince themselves that it was Jesus because it wasn't in the boat that he told them to get into. Do not confuse what I'm saying, honey. When, every, when they realized it was him, everything changed. 
but their own fear. They were so petrified by what was happening outside of the boat that they lost sight of their purpose. I believe he's giving them an object lesson. It is so important to realize, to remember, the boat was Jesus' idea. He's never going to forsake the boat. If he told you to get in it and row, honey, you can row fearlessly. I have no concern for what's going to happen. And God is going to have us right in the middle of the palm of his hand. But he's not confined to a brick structure. He's not confined to a wooden vessel. He's not confined to lie. He can do whatever he wants. He is God. And so Peter jumps up and says, if that's really you, I want to help. He said, if that's really you, I want to come out there where you are. Bid me to come. Jesus says, come. He's never been out there before. He gets out of the boat. This goes against everything that he's been taught since he was a baby. He grew up by the water. He's a fisherman and dad's a fisherman. His brothers are fishermen. Can you imagine the caution that was pounded into him from the time he was a little bitty guy? The last thing you do in a storm is get out of the boat. My, my dad had me by himself unsupervised when I was a baby. I don't know what mom was thinking. And we were near water. So he took the dog leash and he latched it to me and tied me to the bumper of the truck so I couldn't get near the water. That's Jim Moore Parenting 101. I was reminiscing about that story with him one time when he had Daniel. Daniel was three or four, so he tied Daniel to a tree just for old time's sake. Grandparenting, well, we did not do things like time out and soft-spoken phrases. It was, it was a different universe back then. And my dad wasn't a fisherman, but he was terrified of children and water mixing together. My grandmother never learned to swim. Her mom would not let her get in the water until she knew how to swim because it's not safe. So here's this professional fisherman who's a grown man and his dad was a fisherman and probably grandpa too the way it worked back then. And now he's climbing out of the boat and he's climbing into the storm. He's in a place he has never been before and the rest of the group is staying behind. John's not out there with him. James isn't out there with him. Andrew's not out there with him. Everything from popular opinion to his own past is saying don't push that far but he abandons the safety net he steps outside of the walls of protection he's right over the bow of the boat he's moving in elements that are foreign to him but Jesus has already mastered him this is new to me but it's not new to him I've got no idea what I'm doing but he knows exactly what he is doing after all before he even crawled out he asked Jesus will you please bid me to come he's walking on water and it's not calm water it's not clear water there are waves it's a storm it is not an ideal setting it's not glassy or beautiful marble top seas he's on this ocean with whipping waves and contrary winds but if it's Jesus that told him to do it then he knows he has to go and there he is it's an experience he's never had before it's a different kind of miracle he is moving in faith and no doubt in fear too and he's in a realm he's in a realm that everybody else can't understand they're still in the boat and there's nothing wrong with that because Jesus told him to get in the boat and to go to the other side of the sea can I help you when he's dealing with you to do something spectacular and different and supernatural don't waste your time bad mouthing everybody in the vessel he didn't bid them to come he bid you to come not everybody has to have the same burden you do not everyone has to have the same calling you do. Not everybody has to be wired like you are. I've seen it cause division, not here, but in other places. I've seen it cause division. Different people are driven by different things. You know this? You probably did. You're smart. Some people are worship driven, praise and worship driven. And, and some people are word depth driven. You know, they want you to teach them stuff in Greek words and Hebrew words. That was your dad. I miss him all the time. And, uh, uh, and then, then uh, some people are fellowship driven. 
And some people are evangelism driven. And some people are spiritual experience and manifestation driven. I mean, you know, why say it in English when we can say it in tongues and have three interpretations? And, uh, and, and I'd rather have a prophecy than, than, than you know, just, just know something. And, and if you really want God to move, then you need somebody to call you out and say, your grandma in Alabama's wearing green socks. And you call her and tell her the Lord's, that's awesome. And all of those things in proper context are biblical. But your personality... And I dare say what God does in your life can lead you in one of those areas, not to the abandonment of others, but what God's dealing with you to do can become all-consuming. Some people, children's ministry driven. I remember uh, we were in uh, Orangefield and, and Hurricane Rita took the roof off the church and we had to meet in a fellowship hall and it was too big for us to eat in, now we've got to have church in it. I couldn't do it now. I've gained 50 pounds, but, but I'm standing behind between the wall and a pulpit. And like this is up and this is back and I'm done. I had a friend that wanted to come preach for us, but he was too heavy until we got back in the sanctuary. He'd never fit between the pulpit and the wall. <laughs> There's no altars. You just got to pray right where you are. And this disappeared. It was this. And, and, and we had a volunteer rotation. If we have visitors tonight, this family has to leave because there's nowhere to put them. It makes me so frustrated when, 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 when people are willing to, you know, tell a visitor, you're in my seat. Ooh. I told this to our leadership meeting one time. We were preaching a revival somewhere in Texas, and there's a lady who's gone on to be with the Lord now. And we got there an hour early, us and the pastor, and my, my wife's uh, kneeling down praying. She's a 20-something-year-old evangelist wife, and she's down there praying for God to move in service and draw people that need the Lord. And don't let my husband say anything dumb and embarrass me in this brand-new place. And up comes this sweet lady in her 80s, and in that big old empty sanctuary, she had picked that lady's robe. And she walks right up to her and starts kicking her in the ribs. Move, you're in my seat. She was horrified. It made my day. I couldn't even help. I was like, she, how hard can she kick? She's 85 years old. I'm in the corner just, just blessed. I'll never understand it. I'll never understand it. It's the same spirit that makes you be rude to folks you don't think know the Lord in gas stations and nice to people that are there to... I'll never understand it. But I know we're out of room. So this is how Children's Church was born in our world. She takes all the kids upstairs. And every service they did Children's Church. And by the time we were able to get that building back together, God had poured such a burden on her. And, and it started a ministry that snowballed. And, 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 and had taken them places. It was born out of necessity, but that became her passion. And so people with a burden for children's ministry, if they're not careful, can't understand people who don't have that particular burden. What's wrong with you? Jesus said something for the little children to come unto me. Are you, you, you hate Jesus? And people who are, who are just impassionate, they, they feel called to, 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 to help lead us in praise and worship. They can get frustrated at folks who aren't wired that way. And people who are just word depth, I mean, it calls out to them. And why say this in English when you can say it in Greek and Hebrew and, and, and maybe another language that some people think the Bible may have been written in and we can't prove it, but it preaches so much better out of that one. And they yearn for it. And then some people, like a friend of mine, they feel like the whole world's going to hell and the church exists to stop that from happening. Everything, I agree, everything we do should be evangelistic. I agree. I've got a friend right now pastoring a large church in another state. Let's call it Kansas. And if I called him, and I said, hey, we're having marital trouble. He'd say, I'm going to mail you a chart, and if you'll start teaching Bible studies together, God will heal your family. He said, hey, really bumming me out. Not through with college yet. I'm going to send you a chart and you start teaching professors Bible studies and they'll just give you a degree. Hey! Tired of being single. I'm going to send you a chart and you start teaching Bible studies and win people. You'll probably win your own wife today. Tempted to drink. Here's some tracks. Stand outside the liquor store and give one to every wino that comes by. God's going to deliver you from alcoholism. Because all they can see and hear 
It's the cry of the lost. Now you hear me. If you think for four seconds that you get to choose, well, I like the word, could care less about lost people. I like to worship, could care less about the gifts of the Spirit. I don't know who you think you are. It all belongs to the Lord. If he wants to do it, I want him to do it in the middle of us. But when he calls out to me and says, more, get out of the boat and walk over here to me, I can't point at the other 11 and wonder what's wrong with them. Maybe they're right where he wants them to be, but I've got to listen to what he's telling me because when I stand before him I want to have a clear I was born 2,000 years too late because the height of the average man in Israel when Jesus was born depending on who you read was five foot two to five foot four I'm NBA tall I'm just a couple of millennia late I don't know how how tall are you five eight five eight that's crazy. How tall are you? I, I won't tell anybody. Five two? <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out like I thought it would. Do you know Peter may have well been your height? Stand up for a second. You don't look at all like a fisherman. I, I won't embarrass you. We won't even tell anybody we're doing. Yes, yeah, stand up, stand up. Think about this. Average man at the time of Christ, five foot two. Now, I don't know, okay, you're, you're the man, so she said, I don't know how high the waves were. I know we've been in a little boat, and when the, when the seas hit four foot, the captain said, we're turning around and going back to Pensacola, because this ain't happening. I was acting like I was having the time of my life, and inside I was going, thank God. We turned around and began to trail back. I don't know how tall waves had to be or how big their wooden vessel was for it to be boisterous, for them to notice it. But I've always wondered when those waves crested, if they're higher than, than five foot, if maybe Peter's playing a game with Jesus. Now you see me? And now you don't. And I got my eyes on him when it's down. And I can't quite see them when it's up. Some people have a hard time. I mean, when they've got the chill bumps and stammering lips, they're locked in and good to go. But when Tuesday comes and the wave crest at work and they can't quite feel what they felt on Sunday and they don't quite see what they saw on Wednesday, they have a hard time with it. Can I tell you what to do? Honey, when you can't feel it and you can't see it, you just keep traveling right towards where you know he was. The last time you heard him and the last time you saw him, he... Here Peter is with an experience he's never had. In this particular case, the brethren aren't coming with him. And Jesus never told him to. Something sparked in him. If that's you, call me out. Didn't spark in them. Well, they're all deadbeat backsliders. They're in the boat Jesus told them to get into, row into the destination Jesus told them to row to. When God's dealing with you, let him deal with you. You figure out what he's trying to do for you. He keeps his focus on the master and he's fine. It doesn't matter what the weather's doing if I can focus on the weatherman. It doesn't matter how hard the wind's blowing if I can see him. It doesn't matter how high the waves are until I can no longer focus on him. It doesn't matter who's criticizing as long as I can see him. It doesn't matter who's not on board as long as I can see him. It doesn't matter what the nation as long as I can see him. When he maintained his focus on the master, everything was fine. But then the Bible said he started watching the wind. You listen to me. If you're going to walk on water, you can't watch the wind. If you're going to step out and do the impossible, just you and Jesus. You can't pay attention to the weather. You can't allow the political temperature. You can't allow the social temperature. You can't allow the current state of the economy. You can't allow those who aren't coming. You've got to get your eyes off of that and lock them into him. So here he is. As long as he can see it. As long as his focus is appropriate. He's literally doing the impossible. Now some people, I'm not even sure they're in the ship because Jesus told them to go there so much as they know how to sell it. They're comfortable 
in what they know. They're comfortable in the familiar. Oh, I don't have time to get into that. Honey, not everybody has to climb out on the water. But everybody has to be willing to. If that's what he wants them to do. So once he makes that move, no doubt there are those who say, that dummy, if he wants to do that, God bless him. I'm hanging on to the oar. If he wants to go down that road, I hope. You know what? This is where we get sideways. Jesus told me to get in the boat. Now maybe they shouldn't share their opinion. But if you're going to listen to that call on your heart, you can't pay attention to what they're saying anyway. It's not on their heart. I am convinced that there's no safety outside of the king and the kingdom. But I'm also equally convinced that there's no harvest in the boat. If we're going to be fishers of men, we've got to be willing to cast and when necessary climb out when he moves on us to do that. Because this end time harvest, it's not going to come in the boat, honey. It comes from the stormy winds around us. And we need to be a part of what Jesus Christ is doing wherever he does it. That doesn't mean that I'm abandoned in the boat. Honey, Jesus and Peter are both headed right back to the ship. There's only one ship. They used to sing about the good old gospel ship. There's no only one way. There's only one plan. But we cannot become so small in our thinking that we limit everything that God's going to do in Longview, Texas to what happens inside of three or four sanctuaries. We got to hurry. I can watch the wind. I can listen to the doubters. Or I can fix my eyes on him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There was a phenomenon some years ago, I guess nearly a hundred years ago now. Not quite, when soap operas first became a thing. I asked my mom to confirm with her just earlier during worship service. One of the participants of that phenomenon was my great-grandmother, my, my grandfather's mom, your grandma. And she tuned in every day to the soap operas. Television was new. Soap operas were new. And that sweet Northeast Mississippi lady who suddenly had an entire world open for her viewing pleasure believed that everything she was watching was real. She would express concern to the family about marriages and odd situations unfolding. She's staying up at night worried about families that aren't real, they don't exist, and that no good cheating, so, and this Stephen Scout. None of it was real. I was sharing that one day and was told about a lady who came to church, prayer request. She's giving them updates every service to the most horrific situation. This whole little South Louisiana church, they're praying for these people they've never heard of. Finally, I don't know what sparked it, the pastor and his wife went to her house and said, Sister, we've got to wrap our head around this. What's going on? And somewhere in the midst of the conversation, they finally deduced she's talking about a soap opera. It's not even real, but it's real to her. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about reality checks. Because nothing has to be true for you to live like it's true to you. This whole live your truth, honey, that is a lie from hell. Jesus said, I am the truth. But for those of you who are worried about Bo and Hope or whoever's on Days of Our Lives. I haven't seen an episode since 1983, thank God. I don't even know if they still have it. Yeah. If I get cable tomorrow, that's not what we're watching. For those of you, I don't, I don't even know modern soaps. When I was a kid, there was General Hospital. There was uh, Days of Our Lives. One Life to Live. Somebody help me out. I don't know anymore. 
guiding light. They sound like gospel songs. <laughs> you weren't cool either, were you? <laughs> Can I help you? No matter how bad it looks, no matter how long you think Stefano's been dead, no matter what's happening to their eyesight, no matter how the cancer diagnosis looks or who kidnapped the kids or what cartel has swiped what, what young man, you listen to me. You don't ever have to freak out. It's not real. But if you're so attached that you can't get past that, the writer holds in their pen the ability to create the impossible and the fantastic and the phenomenal. And they can always write a way out of trouble. And they can always write a solution when they're done doesn't seem to be one. Paul said he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I wish we could live with the idea this doesn't feel good and this doesn't look good. But he loves me and I love him. And he's going to write me through this and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Let's stand. I know what time it is. Our human nature is so negative it's so negative we read in two different places Isaiah and then in 2 Kings 20 where Hezekiah is sick unto death and God sends the prophet Isaiah to tell him you've been a good man and you've done the right thing but to get it together Bubba you're about to die and not live and he turns his face to the wall and he starts praying God you know how I've kept the truth and I've walked before you I haven't been perfect but I've had a perfect heart and I've done what was good in your sight and he's weeping and he's weeping and he's weeping and he's weeping and Isaiah's only in the middle court he's not out of the palace grounds yet and God turns him around and sends him back and says you go tell him that I'm the God of David his father and I've heard his prayers and I've seen his tears and I'm going to add unto his days 15 years and so he went and he told him in verse 8 of 2 Kings 20 Hezekiah said to Isaiah what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me like some of us Middle of the prophecy and spirit moving. God says, get ready, you're going to die. Oh, I am. The spirit of God walks by and says, God's about to heal you. Yeah, I might need an angel to back that up. Great falling away. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. The Russians are going to nuke America. And the communists and the Muslims are going to get together and take over. And they're going to outlaw church at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And everybody's cat's going to die of COVID. That last part wouldn't be all bad, but oh yeah, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Outpouring healing, miracle, latter day revival. Yeah. Lord, give us a sign that we know this thing be true. Tell him he's gonna die. Yes, I am. You tell him he's gonna live. We're wired for the negative. Giants, grasshoppers, their sight, whatever you're going to take it. You're right. Everything God said, clusters of grapes one man couldn't carry. It's all set up for us. It's like that famous poem where they're asking the cat, where have you been? I've been to London to visit the queen. What saw you there? I frightened a mousy under her chair. In the midst of finery and royalty and red carpets and Buckingham Palace and Big Ben and London Bridge and the changing of the guard, you know what I saw? A mouse. In the most famous palace on earth, in front of the most famous throne on earth at this time, looking at the longest ruling monarchial family right now on earth, what'd you see? A mouse. There are people like that. Can, you, can I help you? Some of you need to pray, God, deliver me from a spirit that's so pessimistic and so negative that I can't even believe good news when it comes from you. You think that just ble bleeds over into your economy and your marriage and your politics. Honey, it affects your spiritual life. That's why there's people right here who believe in the Holy Spirit. They see it in the scripture. They believe he's going to get it and she's going to get it. But they got 92 reasons on why they're not going to. 
because I, God can heal you and God can heal you and God can make Gary Barnett tall and God, God, God can make Justin Jones short and uh, God can make James Moore skinny, but you know, my hangnails different. My needs are different. My issues are different. I wish I had time. We're not even going to get to Romans where sin doth abound. Grace doth much more abound. There is a satanic assault against the world. Against God's breathing living church in the world against truth and scriptural sanity, against families in the Western world. But you hear me, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. God made the ship for the storm. God made the ship for the storm. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. And in the midst of the insanity, we have to maintain our focus, because if we take our eyes off Him and just see the wind, or just see the news, or what Trump said about this, or what Biden said about that, if we just look at the chaos around us, we are never going to see the hand and work of God before us. we got to live with clarity we are troubled on every side yet not distressed perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed we are gonna have our issues but honey he built the boat for bad weather he's going to take care of us he's gonna take care of us kingdom of God's like a barge they load them down to ship them the heavier the load the more stable they become cast all your cares on him when you lay it all on him honey it doesn't bring instability it calms that vessel right in the middle of the sea Today I'm not preaching about what God can do in your bad marriage or your messed up spouse or your backslid kids or your messed up parents. I'm talking about what He can do for you while you're living through it right now. Not what He can do for your boss and He can do anything. What He can do for you. Not what He can do for your diagnosis. What He can do for you. Not what He can do for the weather. What He can do for you. It's not about the storm anyway. It's about the disciples and it's about Jesus. And if we fix that connection Connection. He can stop the seas in a moment or he can bring me right through the worst of them. He has it all in hand. Let's lift our hearts to him together right now, can we? Oh, God. I don't want to miss your purpose in my days. I don't want my own will or desires or personality to so cloud my view that I can't see you working in my mind. Help us to lock and fix our eyes on you. Whatever discouragement or storm or fear or frustration I'm living through. God, whatever chaos, insanity, and issues I live through. Help me to keep my eyes fixed. My focus on you and your purpose. God, you, your person and your purpose your person and your purpose your word, your spirit, your way your plan you and your purpose in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name oh come on I know I'm seven minutes late but I wonder can we just find a place to talk to him for a moment focus has to be on him I thank God for the boat I thank God for the people that are in it with me but the focus has to be on him I thank God for the family I thank God for the plan the focus has to be on him